110 pound pair of boots or a 50 pound pair of boots and you have 60 quid and her eyes opened and she said to me i've never thought of it that way before so here we are uh, with martin talking about the three d's death divorce dementia I kind of wanted to talk to you about, because maybe because of my age demographic, about divorce and um, about lots of people in midlife go through a divorce of some sort. And either you are left um, never having done finances in, in your relationship before and not knowing how to do them because somebody else just always took care of that. Uh, or you are left, obviously, with half of everything that you had before. What are some smart moves um, that you can do post-divorce? Well, can we do pre-divorce first? Yes. Because it's actually very important. I have a warning I call the three Ds, right? Death, divorce, dementia. Told you it was jolly. Um, and these are things that people never want to think about. For those in a relationship, and, and while this is changing, especially the, the older you go up the scale, the less people had independent finances, the more they had joint finances. And let's be straight, the more the man was in charge of the money. It is changing. It's certainly not universal. But in, in most relationships, there is a senior financial partner, I'm going to call them, one who looks after the money. And I have can't tell you how many times I've heard over the years, someone, I, I, I'm going to do my impression of one man, I, I'll never forget him, who said, oh, the little lady doesn't need to worry about the finances. I do it all for her. Now, apart from the fact that that's obviously cringe in its own right, yeah. I told him off, not just for the implicit sexism. Um, it's a terrible thing to do. So I don't care if you're the, let me talk to the senior financial partners, not the juniors right now. If you think you are doing your spouse a favor by looking after all the finances for them, you are absolutely wrong. If you're in a relationship, financial decisions are crucial, but also understanding the finances is crucial. So what every couple needs to do, unless you're doing it jointly, is whoever's leading the finance, every three months you sit down, you talk through what you've done, you talk through the products that you have, Who's the energy bill with? Who's the home insurance with? Who are all the other policies? Where are the savings? You put them in a financial fact sheet, I call it, which is, don't put passwords on there. It's a list of accounts and who the product providers are. So that, God forbid, one of the three Ds happen, death, divorce, or dementia. Mm. The junior financial partner isn't a naif being born at the age of 48 and suddenly having to start their life financially yes. all again. They've got some experience. I once did a speech at Ideal Home, and I had three women in the queue afterwards, because I, I get everyone to come say hello afterwards. Three women in a row, all of whom had lost their partners within the last year all of whom had no facts, said, what do I do? I don't know what to do. One of whom, one of whom was in dire straits because she couldn't pay the mortgage or the money was in her husband's name and probate was slow. So she was uh, risking losing a house, even though they had the money. Now, two things that come from that. First of all, make a will, people. Make a will. Look, I read about it the other day, so I'm not, and, 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 and I love her very much, and I'm not afraid to say this, and I've done this on the programme. You know, if, if you, you know about Kate, Kate Garraway and Derek, the, the wonderful Derek. Kate is struggling now with the finances because she hasn't got a power of attorney. And a power of attorney... I'll show you something. Yeah. Is that your power of attorney? Well done. I've just got it. I've just, I've just sorted it today. I was thinking, do you know what? I need to get this sorted. My dad has Alzheimer's and it's really made me think about everything. And my sister died when she was 50. So I, I kind of like, I have this thing where I think, do you know what? Got to get everything in order. So it's funny you should talk about that. Sorry, I interrupted. No, it's absolutely fine. I'm, I'm delighted to hear it. And please advocate for it on your channels, right? And, and just so people understand, what power of attorney does, it means if one of you were to, if you were to lose your faculties, somebody else can take over your finances. There's also one for health. They can make health decisions. Now, interestingly, just because it can be, you know, there's nefarious issues here. My wife could not take over my finances. I have two friends who've been my friends for a long time. Laura would never dream of doing this in a million years. No. But, this, but we do it the right way. And well, I'd like to set an example in what I do. So I have two friends who are independent friends who would have to approve that Laura could take over my finances if I've lost my faculties. Anyway, so you have a power of return. And if you don't, as Kate has faced now, you have to go to the court of protection that is expensive, timely and stressful to take over someone's finances. And the number of people stroke, Alzheimer's, dementia, who haven't sorted it in time, and then at one of the most stressful periods in their lives, are, are, are sort of finances 
even to pay for the care of the loved one who's got the problem is enormous. So I, in many ways, a power of attorney is actually more important than a will. The one advantage when you die is there's no dispute over whether you've died or not, right? And you don't have care to pay for. You can you, you, can, fill it out, you can fill it all out online. You don't have to get an expensive lawyer or solicitor. Although if you have complex finances, it is worth doing one. So it's all on, it's like a will. It's at the level of complexity, but doing it online and working out who's doing it. And it's wonderful. It's, what a coincidence with that. That was set up for people watching. I didn't know. You hadn't said. I mean, so those are sort of some pre-divorce issues. Once you've gone through divorce, don't panic would be the first thing I'd say. You're going to have to live independently. You're going to have to take control of the finances. I, I'm very keen on financial education. We set up last year the, the MSc Academy. Money. I love tell that. You, it's actually the MSc Academy, Academy of Money, and it's an open university course on finance work that we do. Literally. It's That's totally cool. free. That's a free course. It's got six two-hour courses with a test at the end. You can use it as an open learning accreditation, not towards the university. But, you know, actually spending so is totally free, not, not advertising or sponsored. It's just free. We just invest in it because it's good. Doing something like that, just to give you the confidence, because okay. a lot of decisions about confidence would be useful. Trusted resources, money-saving expert, which some of the newspaper websites are good. Do your reading first. People always ask me, you, you know, people know they can save money on credit cards or energy. They're not sure how, but they know they can. But there's so many other things that you can save money on that you don't know. Never assume you can't. Again, talk about my roadshow experience when I'm out doing the roadshows. About a third of third of the questions I get are what I call permission questions. Well, the people will come a lot, explain something, explain what they've decided to do with it. And the question is just, that's right, isn't it? <laughs> and usually the answer is, yeah. So... Find a financial buddy. If you know someone who's decent with finance, then if you're nervous about something, say, will you spend half an hour with me? I want to explain what I'm planning to do and why I'm planning to do it. Don't get them to do the work, but talk them through it. You'll talk yourself into it. Have another trusted brain who'll go, yeah, that sounds sensible. And crossing that final hurdle is often difficult when you're doing your own finances. And do a budget. If you need to budget, do a budget. I was always really frightened of um, spreadsheets and I've got a financial buddy now. And um, I've been taught how to do a spreadsheet. There are so many tools online that will make it easier for you. And don't be frightened of it or just find somebody that can take you through it because it's easier than you think. I, I think there are two warnings about doing a basic budget. There are two things that people get wrong. So the first thing is they look at a month's income. No. Right? No. No. How often does Christmas happen? Once a year. How often do you go on holiday? Most people, what, once a year, twice a year if they're lucky? How often do you buy a new sofa for the house? Every three oh, years? Yeah. Oh, you're okay. You weekly where we're shop, going. <laughs> your weekly slot, your weekly shop is weekly. So to, to look at a month does not get... Anyone who does a budget by the month will find that they will go, yeah, I'm doing fine. It balances. Most people yeah, balance. Some people holiday. Balance. Yeah, because you forgot Christmas. Six hundred pounds a year on Christmas is fifty pounds a month. Thousand pounds a year on your holiday is eighteen eighty-five pounds a month. They are part of your monthly budget, so you need to be looking over a longer period and factoring in those one-offs, those annual expenditures. It's only once you include those you suddenly realise now I know why I'm building up the debt. That's where the extra money is going that I hadn't factored in. So that's the first step. The second step is don't do motoring. No motoring. What's that about? Two hundred and fifty quid a month on my no. You need. Uh, any car repayment costs, petrol is separate, MOT, tire replacement, breakdown cover, car insurance, itemise each item. Don't do macro groups, do micro groups. And then once you've done your budget, because doing a budget's easy, sticking to it, right? If anyone's struggling to stick to a budget, and there are apps that can do this for you, but you don't need apps, what I call piggy banking, some call jam jarring. Your bank account lies. Your bank account is a little liar. Right. When you look what's in your bank account, it tells you what's in today, not what's coming out tomorrow. No. But you've got to spend it. Just tells you what's to death. So it's a liar. Yeah. And you've got to remember it lies. How do you stop it lying? Well, what you do is once you've done your budget, you look at what your main spendings are. Well, you'll have bills. We'll all have bills. You might have, we'll do Christmas, we'll do holidays, we'll do clothes spending. What the hell? We'll pick those four things out. And you work out how much you can afford to spend on each of those. Your bills, you have to do the rest are discretionary. So each month, your money comes into your bank account. Boom. We'll have a savings one as well. And then you're going to put 500 quid in bills, made up numbers, 500 
500 quid in bills, 50 in Christmas, 100 in my holiday account, 50 in my clothes account, 50 in my savings account. And those can be separate accounts. You can do it on a spreadsheet or you can have actual separate accounts you put the money in. Then when you want to go on holiday, you go to your holiday account, there's 400 quid in. You can't afford more than 400. You can afford 400. If there's no more than that in, that's what you're going to have to spend. You might be able to say, I'm going in two months, so there'll be 600 in in two months, so I'll do 600. I'll accept that, but that's the idea. But also now when you look at your bank account, there's no bills to come out. There's none of these other one-off expenditures. It's not a liar. It's actually telling you what you can spend this month. Many people swear by that method. Quite a few swear at that method, but that's fine. It works. Anything that you can put discipline on yourself. It is really important. And people people look at this as, oh, don't, ah. Oh, this is a recipe for happiness. And there's a certain pride when you think, okay, totally. look, you know, I'm not going to spend more than that. And you don't, you think, actually, I've shopped around and I have found a holiday, but it just took me a little while to... to Absolutely. To but I've actually found a holiday that was just as good as last year's one for 200 quid less. I, I must tell you, because of your audience, I, you said it's a mainly female audience. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine who hates this story, but it's a really good way to think, but she hates it. It's before I was married. She wasn't a girlfriend. She's still one of my good friends now. Um, we went to a shop and she wanted a pair of boots. So we were going shopping together and we're out there and she saw two pairs of black leather boots, mm-hmm. right? To my... I'm slightly better now, but to my whatever I was, 28-year-old eyes, these boots look the same. I couldn't tell the difference. But one of them cost 110 quid and one cost 50 quid, right? She's decided between them. So I went to second, I went to the cash machine and I got 60 quid out of the car. I got money out of the cash machine and I came back and I picked up the boots and I said, I just want you to understand. And I held up the 50-pound pair of boots with 60 pounds in my hand and I held up the 110 pounds of pair of boots. Now, both pairs of boots have been said... You can make which choice you like, but you need to understand this is your decision. A £110 pair of boots or a £50 pair of boots and you have 60 quid. And her eyes opened and she said to me, I've never thought of it that way before. Oh, and I haven't brought, either. And then she bought the expensive boots. Um, <laughs> that's good, right. yeah. But, it, but that, that's called opportunity cost. And that is ultimately yeah. the purchasing decision that we make. And yeah. it's always worth thinking about that. Martin, I'm going to stop there. You, you've Please. been like... You've been like, I just want to crawl through the screen and give you such a big hug. You're so comforting and helpful to people. Oh, thank you. And you do so much. And hearing about your charitable work and um, that free, free course you were talking about, which I know is going to help so many people, you've given us like just gold nuggets. Um, so thank you. I really My love pleasure. it very much.